Today we're reading uh, the 10th Tuesday. We talk about marriage. I brought a visitor to meet Maury, my wife. He had been asking me since the first day I came, when do I meet Janine? When are you bringing her? I'd always had excuses until a few days earlier when I called his house to see how he was doing. It took a while for Maury to get to the receiver, and when he did, I could hear the fumbling as someone held his his ear. He could no longer lift a phone by himself. Hi, he gasped. You doing okay, coach? I heard him excel. Mitch, your coach isn't having such a great day. His sleeping time was getting worse. He needed oxygen almost nightly now, and his coughing spells had become frightening. One cold could last an hour, and he never knew if he'd be able to stop. He always said he would die when the disease got in his lungs. I shuddered when I thought how close death was. I'll see you on Tuesday, I said. You'll have a better day then. Mitch? Yeah? Is your wife there with you? She was sitting next to me. Put her on. I want to hear her voice. Now, I am married to a woman blessed with far more intuitive kindness than I. Although she had never met Maury, she took the phone. I would have shaken my head and whispered, I'm not here. I'm not here. And in a minute, she was connecting with my old professors if they'd known each other since college. I sensed this, even though all I heard on the other end was, Uh huh. Uh huh. Mitch told me, Oh, thank you. Then she hung up. She said, I'm coming next trip. And that was that. Now we sat in his office, surrounding him in his recliner. Maury, by his own admission, was a harmless flirt. And while he often had to stop for coughing or to use the commode, he seemed to find new reserves of energy when Janine was in the room. He looked at photos from our wedding when Janine had brought along. You're from Detroit, Maury said. Yes, Janine said. I taught in Detroit for one year in the late 40s. I remember a funny story about that. He stopped to blow his nose. When he fumbled with the tissue, I held it in place and he blew weakly into it. I squeezed it lightly against his nostrils, then pulled it off like a mother does to a child in a car seat. Thank you, Mitch. He looked at Janine. My helper, this one. Janine smiled. Anyhow, my story. There was a bunch of sociologists at the university, and we used to play poker with other staff members, including this guy who was a surgeon. One night after the game, he said, Maury, I want to come to see your work. I said, fine. So he came to one of my classes and watched me teach. After the class was over, he said, all right now, how would you like to see me work? I have an operation tonight. I wanted to return the favor, so I said, okay. He took me up to the hospital, he said. Scrub down, put on a mask, and get in a gown. The next thing I knew, I was right next to him on the operating table. There was this woman, this patient, on the table, naked from the waist down, and he took a knife and went zip, just like that. Well, Maury lifted a finger and spun around. I started to go like this. I'm about to faint, all that blood, yuck. The nurse said to me, what's the matter, doctor? And I said, I'm no damn doctor, get me out of here. We laughed, and Maury laughed, too, as hard as he could with his limited breathing. It was the first time in weeks that I could recall him telling a story like this. How strange. I thought that he nearly fainted once from watching someone else's illness, and now he was able to endure his own. Connie knocked on the door and said that Maury's lunch was ready. It was not the carrot soup and vegetable cakes and Greek pasta I had brought this morning from Bread and Circus. Although I tried to buy the softest of foods now, they were still beyond Maury's limited strength to chew and swallow. He was eating mostly liquid supplements, which perhaps a bran muffin tossed in until it was mushy and easily digested. Charlotte would puree almost everything in a blender now. He was taking food through a straw. I still shopped every week and walked in with bags to show him, but it was more for the look on his face than anything else. When I opened the refrigerator, I would see an overflow of containers. I guess I was hoping that one day he would go back to eating a real lunch together, and I could watch the sloppy way in which he talked while chewing, the food spilling happily out of his mouth. This was a foolish hope. Um, I personally have a go and pause here and go to I personally have a pet peeve with uh, people that chew with their mouth open, and also like. There were people, you know, illegal immigrants who, like, like to stare in my apartment and don't toss things. They're like the jam or something. And they're just so loud. And they hear me read it, and they don't like that. In Hawaii, the reading is frowned upon. I've been on the bus in Hawaii reading a book, and I had some big quiet people who just knock the book out. I've had it happen on more than one occasion. Like, they see something on TV, and they think, 
it's the same in real life. That's a common characteristic of low intelligent people. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> back to the book. But I um, hope you're enjoying this as we're taking this break for the uh, um, nine o'clock hour on my clock. Um, feel free to uh, click the thumbs up while we're uh, taking a break here from Tuesdays this morning. Uh, click the thumbs up and um, go ahead and subscribe and send this to somebody because uh, you know it is interesting. You don't really get much um, uh, culture like this on YouTube. So, right? Just... Oh no, this is an ending. We're just continuing with the story here. I just stopped because of that. You know. Okay. Connie knocked on the door and said that Maury's lunch was ready. It was not the current soup. So, Janine, Maury said. She smiled. You are lovely. Give me your hand. She did. Mitch says that you're a professional singer. Yes, Janine said. He says you're great. Oh, she laughed. No, he, he just says that. Maury raised his eyebrows. Will you sing something for me? Now, I have heard people ask this of Janine for almost as long as I've known her. When people find out she sings for a living, they always say, sing something for us. Shy about her talent and her professionness about conditions, Janine never did. She would politely decline, which is what I expected she would do now. Which is when she began to sing, the very thought of you and I forget to do. The little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. It was a 1930s standard written by Ray Noble, and Janine sang it sweetly, looking straight at Maury. I was amazed, once again, at his ability to draw emotion from people who otherwise kept it locked away. Maury closed his eyes to absorb the notes. As my wife's loving voice filled the room, a crescent smile appeared on her face and on his face. And while his body was stiff as a sandbag, you could almost see him dancing inside it. I see your face in every flower, your eyes and stars above. It's just the thought of you, the very thought of you, my love. When she finished, Maury opened his eyes and tears rolled down his cheeks. In all the years I have listened to my wife sing, I have never heard the way he did at that moment. I never heard her the way he did at that moment. Oh, he never heard his wife sing the way that Maury did at that moment. That's extremely deep. That's why I was like, I, something like goes in my spine and I know something's like deep and it's like in my heart and it like goes down my spine. I can even <laughs> give it to other people too, believe it or not. But anyways. Okay, that's my special power. Marriage. Almost everyone knew I had a problem with it. Some had problems getting into it, some had problems getting out. My generation seemed to struggle with the commitment, as if it was an alligator from some murky swamp. I had gotten used to attending weddings, congratulating the couple, and feeling only mild surprise when I saw the groom a few years later sitting in a restaurant with a younger woman whom he introduced as a friend. You know, I'm separated from so-and-so, he would say. Why do we have such problems? I asked Maury about this. Having wasted seven years before I proposed to Nanine, I wondered if people my age were being more careful than those who came before us or simply more selfish. I think it's a good idea for a man to marry a younger woman if he's never been married before. And he's always gonna be married to that same woman. But I'm old fashioned. So. Well, I feel sorry for your generation, Maury said. In this culture, it's so important to find a loving relationship with someone because so much of the culture does not give you that. But the poor kids today, either they're too selfish to take part in a real loving relationship or they rush into marriage and then six months later they get divorced. They don't know what they want in a partner. They don't know who they are themselves. How could they find who they are marrying? He sighed. Maury had counseled so many unhappy lovers in his years as a professor. It's sad because a loved one is so important. He realized that, especially when you're in a time like I am, when you're not doing so well. Friends are great, but friends are not going to be here on a night when you're coughing and can't sleep and someone has to sit up all night with you, comfort you, try to be helpful. Charlotte and Maury, who met as students, had been married 44 years. I watched them together now when she would remind him of his medication or come in and stroke his neck or talk about one of their sons. They worked as a team, often needing no more than a silent glance to understand what the other was thinking. 
Charlotte was a private person, different from Maury, but I knew how much he respected her because sometimes when we spoke, he would say, Charlotte might be uncomfortable with revealing that, and he would end the conversation. It was the only time Maury held anything back. I've learned this much about marriage, he said. Now, you get tested. You find out who you are, who the other person is, and how you accommodate or don't. Is there some kind of role, rule to know if a marriage is going to work? Maury smiled. Things aren't that simple, Mitch. I know. Still, he said, there are a few rules I know to be true about love and marriage. If you don't respect the other person, you're going to have a lot of trouble. If you don't know how to compromise, you're going to have a lot of trouble. If you can't talk openly about what goes on between you, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And if you don't have a common set of values in your life, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Your values must be alike. And the biggest one of those values, Mitch? Yes. Your belief in the importance of your marriage. The importance of your marriage. He sniffed and closed his eye for a minute. Personally, he sighed, his eyes still closed. I don't think marriage is a very important thing to do. And you're, is a, I think marriage is a very important thing to do. And you're wasting a hell of a lot if you don't try it. He ended the subject by quoting the poem he believed in like a prayer. Love each other or perish. Love each other or perish. Good way to end that segment of the chapter. Now it goes like into the other part of each chapter has a separate edition that's like either a flashback of when uh, Mitch was a student in Maury's class 17 early, years earlier or um, it's just a nice little uh, slice of life. So. This is the end of uh, that 10th Tuesday chapter and the slice of life at the end of it. Okay, question, I say to Maury. His bony fingers held his glasses above his chest, which rises and falls at each labored breath. What's the question, he says. Remember the book of Job from the Bible? Right. Job is a good man, but God makes him suffer to test his faith. I remember. Takes away everything he has, his house, his money, his family, his health makes him sick, to test his faith. Right, to test his faith. So I'm wondering, what are you wondering? What do you think about that? Maury coughs violently. His hands quiver as he drops them by his side. <coughs> I think, he says, smiling, God overdid it. <laughs>